in every part of the world for how you have blessed us, helped us, the strength that you have given to us. We raise our Ebenezer's and we say thus far, the Lord has helped us. And Lord, in the light of all of that, we would trust you for the year to come. We ask that we may have grace to enter into it, confident that as you have been, so you will be, because you are the unchanging God. May we know you as our Father, Christ as our Saviour, the Holy Spirit in our hearts living there as the source and strength of spiritual life. We thank you for bringing us together this morning, and we pray for your blessing to be upon us as we unite our hearts in worship. Speak to us through your word. May all that we do be honoring to you, well-pleasing, and a blessing to our needy souls. And as we seek your blessing upon ourselves, so too, upon every gathering of your people in every part of the world. Bless us and keep us and make your face to shine upon us. We ask all of these things with the pardon of our sins through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let me invite you to take your Bibles now and turn to the book of Job and chapter 7. book of Job and chapter 7. Many of the chapters in this book are the outpourings of Job's anguish because of the sorrows that have overwhelmed him, and this is a sample of those chapters. Job's Chapter 7. Has not man a hard service on earth? And are not his days like the days of a hired hand? Like a slave who longs for the shadow, and like a hired hand who looks for his wages, so I am allotted months of emptiness, and nights of misery are apportioned to me. When I lie down, I say, When shall I arise? But the night is long, and I am full of tossing till the dawn. My flesh is clothed with worms and dirt. My skin hardens and breaks out afresh. My days are swifter than a weaver's shuttle and come to their end without hope. Remember that my life is a breath. My eye will never again see good. The eye of him who sees me will behold me no more. While your eyes are on me, I shall be gone. As the cloud fades and vanishes, so he who goes down to Sheol, that is the grave, does not come up. He returns no more to his house, nor does his place know him any more. Therefore I will not restrain my mouth. I will speak in the anguish of my spirit. I will complain in the bitterness of my soul. Am I the sea or a sea monster that you set a guard over me? When I say my bed will comfort me, my couch will ease my complaint, then you scare me with dreams and terrify me with visions so that I would choose strangling and death rather than my bones. I loathe my life. I would not live forever. Leave me alone, for my days are a breath. What is man that you make so much of him, and that you set your heart on him, visit him every morning, and test him every moment? How long will you not look away from me, nor leave me alone till I swallow my spit? If I sin, what do I do to you, you watcher of mankind? Why have you made me your mark? Why have I become a burden to you? Why do you not pardon my transgression and take away my iniquity? For now I shall lie on the earth. You will seek me, but I shall not be.
Please take your hymn books and turn to 391. And this hymn strikes a very different note from the one that we have heard. Job has entered his rest, and so too myriads of saints since, and if we are believers, we too will enter our rest. And this celebrates the blessing that is in store for us as the people of God, for all the saints who from their labors rest, who thee by faith before the world confessed, thy name, O Jesus, be forever blessed. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We're going to sing verses 1 to 3, and then verses 6 to 8. Six out of the eight verses, 1 to 3, and then verses 6 to 8. 391. with something that God knows, but which we ourselves don't know, none of us. And that is exactly how long we are going to live. I don't know how long I am going to live, and you don't know how long you are going to live, but God knows. And the reason that God knows is because 
he has already decided. We've just been reading in Job chapter 7. If we were to go over a few chapters to chapter 14, we would read about God determining our days and setting limits that we cannot pass. What does Job mean? Well, what he means, boys and girls, is this. It is impossible for us to live longer than God has decided that we will live. There is a day for us to be born, and there is a day for us to die. And every day that passes takes us further from the one and nearer to the other. Further from the day that we were born and nearer to the day that we will die. Now, I want to show you a picture of what our lives are like. I wonder, does anyone know what this is? Go ahead, Abigail. That's one name. What's, what's the old name for it? Does anyone know what it's called? Go ahead, you want to have a guess? It's an hourglass. That's absolutely right. It's an hourglass. Now, boys and girls, you can see how it's made. Two glass bulbs, one on top of the other, with a very narrow neck in between. And that neck is hollow. And it's hollow for a reason. Because right in the bottom, the bottom bulb, there is some very, very fine sand. And if I turn this upside down, you probably won't be able to see it because it's so fine, but the sand begins to trickle through. Now, does anyone know how long it will take for this sand to trickle through? Anyone like to have a guess? The clue's in the name. Go ahead, Lydia. An hour. And actually, this is pretty accurate to within a minute or two. So I'm going to put it here, and we'll see if it goes through in an hour. Now, hourglasses, boys and girls, have been on the go for a very long time. For centuries, they were used for measuring the passage of time. But sand glasses, of, hourglasses, have always been used as a picture of what our lives are like. You see, turn it upside down, and the bulb at the top is full. Sand is filling the top. But gradually... It's going to go through and through, and it's going to become less and less until the top bulb is empty. And that is a picture of how our lives are. We start with a fixed number of days. We saw that a moment back from Job. God has fixed the number of our days. And as time goes by, the number gets fewer and fewer and fewer, until the hourglass of our lives is empty. We've reached the end. There's a hymn that we sing uh, which starts, the sands of time are sinking. Do you ever wondered what those words meant, the sands of time? I don't think I even ever asked the question. That's from this, sands of time sinking and our lives coming toward an end. Well, boys and girls, this is the last day of the year. How many days have passed since the 31st of December last year? Go on. Anya. <laughs> From the, since the last, day of, the last day of last year. How many? Go ahead. 365, that's right. Now, boys and girls, just listen. That means that each of us, each of us, has 365 days less in the hourglass of our lives than when this year began. And we don't know when the hourglass of our lives will be empty. You can watch this, and I'm going to leave it here for the whole service. You can watch it filling up and the emptying. But we can't do that with our lives. We don't know when the hourglass of our lives is going to be empty. And that, boys and girls, is why it is so, so, so important that you don't put off coming to Christ. 
It is why it is so, so, so important that you come to Christ now because we don't know when the hourglass of our lives will empty. So the time to come to the Lord Jesus is now. And then it won't matter when the hourglass empties because we will be ready to meet Jesus. Well, let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, your word tells us that the number of our days is fixed. There are limits set that we cannot pass. You have determined how long each of us will live. But you have not shown us when we will reach that limit. Lord, we pray that as we come this morning to think about the shortness of our lives and how swiftly they are passing, you would impress upon us the need to be ready to meet you and not to delay another hour. We pray for the boys and girls and young people who are here this morning. We thank you for how you have preserved their lives over this past year. How we pray that each of them would, before this day is done, if they have not done so already, put their trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. How we thank you that if he is our Savior, it does not matter how far advanced our lives are, how soon they will come to an end. He is with us and will take us to be with himself. Hear us, O God, we pray. For Jesus' sake, amen. Let's turn in our hymn books to 720 before we turn to God's Word. That hymn we've just been singing looks to the future. What about the meantime? Well, in the meantime, we give thanks to the Father for giving us His Son and leaving His Spirit till the work on earth is done. And we give thanks to God for that work of the Holy Spirit. There is a Redeemer. Jesus, God's own Son. Hymn number 720.
Let's pray together. Father, we thank you that you have given us the Holy Spirit to be with us as individuals and as the church. We thank you for his ministry in taking the word that he himself moved men to write, opening it up to our understandings, applying it with power to our hearts and lives. Blessed Spirit of God, our prayer is that you will do that in our midst this morning and in every other place where the Word of God is being opened and faithfully taught. We pray for the honor and glory of our triune God, for the building up of the saints. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, let me invite you to turn back to the book of Job and to chapter 7. The book of Job and chapter 7. And I want to draw your attention this morning to something that was very much on Job's mind amidst the sufferings that had overwhelmed him, something that on this final day of the year is very much on others' minds, perhaps on your mind, and that is the shortness of life and the swiftness with which it passes. Let's listen to some of the things that Job says. In chapter 7, verse 7, for example, he says to the Lord, remember that my life is a breath, a mere breath. And in verse 16, he repeats it. I loathe my life. I would not live forever. Leave me alone, for my days are a breath. Over to chapter 9. In verse 25, he says, My days are swifter than a runner. They flee away. In verse 26, they go by like skiffs of reed. And in the same verse, they are like an eagle swooping on the prey. Or we could go over to chapter 14. Man who is born of a woman is a few days and full of trouble. He comes out like a flower and withers. He flees like a shadow and continues not. It was very much on Job's mind. And he multiplies the images, a breath a shadow, a runner, a skiff of reeds, an eagle swooping on its prey, a flower that blossoms and then withers. The shortness of life and the swiftness with which it is passing. And then the words that I have taken for our text this morning, chapter 7, verse 6, the opening words of that verse. My days are swifter than a weaver's shuttle. The weaver has set up his loom. He's going to weave some cloth in order to make some garment or perhaps a blanket. And one of the things that he uses is a shuttle, so-called because it shuttles the yarn back and forth as he weaves. And if you have seen it, and some of you I'm sure have seen it, you know how swiftly that shuttle goes back and forth. And as Job thinks about his life, that's another of the images that comes to mind. My days are swifter than a weaver's shuttle. Now, there is something that makes his words in verse 6 especially remarkable. Job has just been telling us how long he felt his nights to be. Verse 4, when I lie down, I say, when shall I arise? But the night is long. And I am full of tossing till the dawn. And then in verse 5, he tells us why. My flesh is clothed with worms and dirt. My skin hardens, then breaks out afresh. Do you remember the story? And how Satan was permitted eventually to strike Job's flesh, his body. And he did so. 
covering him with loathsome sores from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head. And one of the things that that did was make his nights long. And doubtless he felt his days long too. And yet for all their slowness, the impression that he has as he looks back is of the swiftness with which his days are passing. My days are swifter than a weaver's shuttle. And perhaps you can relate to that. Days and nights that seem long in passing. And yet how different the perspective when you begin to look back over life. It's your birthday and you can scarcely believe that it's a year since you had your last birthday. Or maybe it's one of those special birthdays when you reach the end of a decade and the start of a new. You're 40 now or 50 or 60 or 70 or 80 or 90. And you look back and it seems no time since you were in your 20s. The swiftness with which life passes. And of course, it's brought home to us on a day like this, the 31st of December 2023, the last day of the year. How swiftly this year has passed. And so with life as a whole, people feel it as they approach the end and look back. How short it seems. How swiftly it has passed. I want this morning to take this theme of the shortness of life, the swiftness with which it passes, and apply it to three things, to our sufferings, to Christian service, and to the all-important matter of seeking the Lord. Here is what we're going to see in the light of the shortness of life and the swiftness with which it passes, we don't have long to suffer. We don't have long to serve the Lord. And we don't have long to seek Him. Well, let me apply it in the first place to our sufferings. Here is what a Christian can say. In the light of the shortness of his life and the swiftness with which it is passing, I don't have long to suffer, only a little while. And I begin with this morning's text, Job 7, verse 6. What's on the screen is only half the verse. Here's what the other half says, and come to their end without hope. My days are swifter than a weaver's shuttle, and come to their end without hope. Job, in other words, has no expectation of things ever changing for the better. As far as he is concerned, things are going to go on being dark for him right to the very end. No hope of his condition improving. We know, however, from the close of the story that that is not how it turned out. Quite the reverse his health recovered. He was blessed again with children. God made him twice as prosperous as he had been before. He lived to a ripe old age. God greatly blessed the latter days of Job's life. And that has had its parallels in the lives of God's people in every age. Their latter years have been their brightest But that's not always how it is. The latter years of many a saint are the most difficult of all, and especially toward the end. Something happens, and the sorrow of it, the burden of it, the consequences of it remain. Like the apostles' thorn in the flesh, it stays the loneliness of widowhood the ongoing effects of some accident, a breakdown in health from which there is no recovery, growing weakness and the loss of certain faculties, a sadness in the family for which there is no cure, 
the consequences of some sin. Life, as it, is, as it advances, is now lived under the shadows. And it is here that we especially can appreciate the blessedness of being a Christian. Because we who are believers have the most solid hope for the future. I think, for example, of what Paul says in Philippians chapter 1, to die is gain. And he tells us why. It is to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. Those of you here this morning who are unconverted have everything to dread. Death will not be gain for you. It will be terrible, irreversible loss. Death closes the door of hope forever on those who die in their sins. It is a terrible thing to die without Christ as Lord and Savior. But not for the believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, for the believer. The future is wonderfully bright and will only ever get brighter. So there's one thing. As life progresses and death draws nearer, the believer need neither fear nor mourn. He or she, on the contrary, has everything to look forward to. And then add to that this morning's theme, the shortness of life and the swiftness with which it passes. What does that enable the believer to say? The older believer, for whom life has become such a shadowed thing, I don't have long to suffer, only a little while. It's reflected in Christian poetry. William Walsham Howe's For All the Saints that we were singing just a few moments back. The golden evening brightens in the west soon, soon to faithful warriors comes their rest. Faithful warriors. The Christian life is a warring life. It's full of spiritual conflict, and that's hard, and for some especially hard. How attractive the prospect of the rest that will soon, soon come. Or I think of the old 53rd paraphrase based on 1 Thessalonians 4, the last verse. A few short years of evil past, we reach the happy shore where death-divided friends at last shall meet to part no more. A few short years. There are believers who come to the point where that is immensely comforting. Or here is Horatius Boner in a poem called A Stranger Here. Well pleased I find years rolling o'er me, and here each day time's measured tread. Far fewer clouds now stretch before me. Behind me is the darkness spread. It's the believer who's far on in life and is thankful that the end is approaching. It's a comfort. I don't have long to suffer, only a little while. Now, I would want to speak with care because God has given us many things that make life both desirable and pleasant. And he has implanted in us a love of life. And it is entirely natural that you should want a long life. And that if you are single, you should want to be married. And that if you are married, you should want to have children. And that if you have children, you should want to see grandchildren. It's entirely natural. It is right that we should want to stay and fulfill the responsibilities that God has given to us, especially if we have a family. 
It is right that we should be eager to see the kingdom of God growing as we have not ever seen it before. Younger Christians in particular ought not to be taken on a guilt trip because they can't yet say with the Apostle Paul that they have a desire to depart. But it is a precious thought, and especially, especially for older Christians for whom weakness, weariness, suffering, sorrow have become part of daily life, the shortness of our lives and the swiftness with which they pass. I don't have long to suffer, only a little while. So we thought about the application of this morning's theme to this matter of our suffering. Now let me apply it in the second place to Christian service. Here is what the Christian can say in the light of the shortness of life and the swiftness with which it passes. I don't have long to serve, only a little while. And I want to begin by showing you that that is exactly how Jesus thought. This is John's Gospel, chapter 9. Jesus is about to heal the man who has been blind from birth. Do you remember what he says to his disciples? We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day, night is coming, when no one can work. Jesus was living in a predominantly agricultural country, and there was no electricity. Work was a daytime occupation. Once the night fell, well, you couldn't do your work. And Jesus takes that very familiar fact from his culture and uses it to illustrate kingdom work, the service of God. There is a day that is given to us to work, and we must be at pains to put that day to best use to work the works of the one who has sent us while it is day. For once the night comes, there's no more working. Now, we know that if we are Christians, we have a whole eternity before us in which it will be our joy and privilege to serve the Lord. John in Revelation chapter 22, speaking about the world to come, says his servants will serve him. The very thing that Jesus illustrates so vividly in his parables of the minors and the talents. How is the faithful servant rewarded? He is rewarded with opportunities to do greater service for his king than ever he was able to do in this life. And it won't be the case that we will only have a little time in which to do it. We will have all the time in the world, a whole eternity in which to serve the Lord. But that's not how it is in the here and now. My days are swifter than a weaver's shuttle. And by this and a variety of other images, Scripture would impress on us the brevity of life and the speed with which it is passing. What does it teach us? It teaches us that we don't have long to serve, only a little while. Now, at one level, that can be very encouraging. We go back to William Waltram House for all the saints. The golden evening brightens in the west. Soon, soon to faithful warriors comes their rest. And when I think about that, it's, it's John Knox, the great Scottish reformer, who comes to mind his health so broken down by the privations that he had suffered in his service for Christ and longing for the day to come when he can rest. And that's how it is when Christian service is hard, when there is persecution, when Satan is powerfully at work, when there is much to grieve the heart, when the struggle with sin is fierce and when you've been at it for years, and perhaps there's very little to show, 
the thought that you will soon exchange these conditions of service for much better conditions of service becomes exceedingly attractive to the Christian. But I am more concerned this morning that we should feel the challenge of this, the shortness of our lives and the swiftness with which they pass. What does that mean? It means that we don't have long to serve the Lord. I think, for example, of the Christian's working life. Daily work is one of the principal spheres in which we are called to serve the Lord. And I fear that that is not considered in that light to the extent that it ought to be. But that is the teaching of Scripture. This is our sphere of Christian service, our daily work. Colossians 3, verses 23 and 24. Whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord, not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ. That is a remarkable statement because Paul is speaking to slaves, and he is telling that in their daily work, they are serving the Lord. And that is how we are to think about it. Here is our sphere, one of the spheres of Christian service, by the way that we do our daily work, by the way in which we conduct ourselves toward others, those who work alongside of us, those who are over us, those who are under us, by the way in which we respond to provocations, by the way in which we handle temptations. If we want to do good to others in this world, if we want to bring glory to God, if we want to show God's grace in ourselves, here is the context in which the Lord has chosen that to happen, the context of daily work. Now, you take that and add to it this morning's theme, how the days and the weeks and the months and the years of our lives so swiftly pass. It may not seem it at the time, the context of working life. Those of you who have retired, don't you see it, feel it, looking back? how swiftly it all passed. We don't have long to serve the Lord in the context of our working life. One day, it will be over. And with it, all the opportunities that daily working life provided to serve the Lord. Or I think to take a second example of family life, and in particular, with our children. And I speak as an empty nester. How swiftly the years pass as our children grow up. That's how it feels, looking back. You parents whose children are still at home, they're growing fast. You can see that. And it won't be long until you're on your own. What should you say to yourself? I have only a short time to invest in these young lives as a Christian father, a Christian mother. Only a short time to teach them, to guide them, to set them a godly example before they're up and off. It is your sphere of Christian service and you occupy it only for a little. How wisely parents of young children should seek to use these swiftly passing days. And then I think to take a third example, church life. Perhaps we think too exclusively of the church as the sphere of Christian service. And that is why I have deliberately taken working life and home life first. They are our spheres of Christian service too. 
But church life is unspeakably important. We are part of the body of Christ. We belong to one another. We are not intended to be Christians in isolation from one another, but Christians together, serving together. The church is not a restaurant. And sadly, there are too many Christians who treat it as a restaurant. They come at the opening time because they enjoy the food and the company. And then when it's gone over, when it's over, off they go until opening time the following Sunday. Now, the church has restaurant facilities. And it becomes every spiritual chef to do his utmost to ensure that when the restaurant is opened, there is good spiritual food for everyone to eat. But the church is not a restaurant. It's not just somewhere where we come, enjoy, and go, and that's it. It's a body of which we are members, members one of another. It is the sphere of Christian service. And how explicitly that is taught in our New Testament scriptures. And the time is passing. And it's passing quickly. And here we are at the end of another year. And the day is going to come when our service is going to end, perhaps to this congregation, perhaps altogether. Or if it doesn't altogether cease, it diminishes because of age and health. What would Jesus say to us about service in the church? We must work the works of him who has sent us. While it is day, the night is coming when no one can work. The shortness of life and the swiftness with which it passes calls us to diligence in serving the church. Say to yourself, I don't have long. The time for rest will come. For now, as life and strength continue, serve the body of Christ wholeheartedly, devotedly. If you like New Year resolutions, take this as a New Year resolution. I resolve by the grace of God that in 2024, I will give myself as fully and as devotedly to the church as I can with my gifts, with my very presence, with all the things that I'm able by His grace to do. And of course, the call for service is not just to older saints, it's for you younger believers too. Now, I would not bring any shadow over your lives, but it is a fact that short as life is at its longest, it can turn out to be far shorter than we hope for. While you have it, youthful strength and energy, the, the envy of older saints, give yourself to the service of Christ in your home, at school, where you work, and in church. It was said of Mary that she did what she could. Let it be said of you as well, younger people, you, you did what you could. And for those of us who are older, here's a congregational minister from the 1800s by the name of Enoch Meller. I think the quotation is in our sermon notes. Let our earnestness increase as the time of service diminishes. Because we cannot labor long, let us labor well. So I have applied our theme, the shortness of life and the swiftness with which it is passing to our suffering and especially the suffering of older saints. I have applied it to the subject of Christian service and that we might feel the challenge of it to do what we can 
Let me, in closing, apply it to the all-important matter of seeking the Lord. If you are not a Christian here this morning, let me urge you to say to yourself, in the light of the shortness of life and the swiftness with which it passes, say to yourself, I don't have long to seek the Lord. Only a little time. Now, this language of seeking the Lord, as you know, I'm sure, is the Bible's own language. It's the very thing to which the Lord himself calls us. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. And then he elaborates, let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord that he may have compassion on him and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. Now there is a question that that exhortation prompts. How long? How long? How long will the Lord be near? How long before he is not able to be found? How long before it is too late? How long before the door of salvation is shut and salvation is beyond your grasp? This at least we can say in the light of this morning's text, it is a short time at best. And it is rapidly passing. You do not have long to seek the Lord. Only a little while. I remind you of the uncertainty of life. We're going to be singing it in a moment or two. Swift to its close. Ebbs out life's little day. How that should alarm you if you are not yet in Christ. How that should awaken you. A little day. And it's swiftly ebbing out. You don't know how much of it remains. You can look at this hourglass on the communion table. And you can see how much of it has still to go through into the bottom bulb. But you can't do that with the hourglass of your life. And perhaps the hourglass of your life is far emptier than you imagine. So many have found that to be so. Promising themselves years because they have life and health and youth. And then for one reason or another, with terrible suddenness, it's over. Now for the believer, it matters Little how swiftly and suddenly lives come to an end. Believers are ready. We touched on it a few moments back. To die is gain. How would it be for you? If your life were to end today, or if Christ were to return today, would you be ready? I appeal to you by the shortness of life and the swiftness with which it passes to seek the Lord now. To come to him while he is near. Or to appeal to you in the Lord's own words, today, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. There is a haunting hymn that I remember from my childhood. Some of you may know it. This is how the refrain goes. Be in time. Be in time. While the voice of Jesus calls you, be in time. If in sin you longer wait, you may find no open gate and your cry be just too late. Be in time. 
speak to you. On the 31st of December last year, you were not converted. And here you are a whole year later and you're still not converted. How swiftly that year has passed. God in his mercy has spared you. Can you be sure that he will continue to do that? You cannot. Your days are swifter than a weaver's shuttle. And soon they will have run their course. Soon the hourglass will be empty. And I appeal to you not to end 2023 still in your sins. Don't go another hour still in your sins when there is a merciful God who has extraordinary cause has provided in the blood of his Son for the cleansing of every one of your sins and the total, permanent, eternal, wonderful transformation of your life. Don't throw that back in his face. God who has spared you himself appeals to you this morning to seek him and to come without any further delay. Well, may God help you. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, how solemn these things are, how challenging. Lord, help us, we pray, not to harden our hearts in your mercy. So work in the hearts of those boys and girls and young people here, others who are not converted, that they may seek you and find you and turn to the Lord Jesus. Hear your people's prayers as they and their hearts cry to you even now for loved ones who are lost. Hear our cry. For Jesus' sake, amen. While we sing together in closing hymn number 852, Abide With Me.
Lord, we thank you for these moments together. We pray that you will abide with us through this day, through all our days, however few or many they may be. Abide with us, we pray, for all eternity. Thank you for Jesus, through whose blood there is the cleansing of all sin and the sure hope of eternal life. Hear us, we pray. Bless us. For his name's sake. Amen. Amen.